Mr. Tim Bolger. And a boy. There we go, Tim. Yay! And a boy. His presentation is a forecast for the next 100 years. Oh boy. This is meeting 3356. It is the geopolitical prognostications of college regular Tim Bolger based upon evidence from various sources. Included will be the role of the United States and the world situation. Come hear how Tim will tell about the coming defeat finally of the former Soviet bloc, the expansions of globalization, the aging of the population, and the solving of global warming. Special evidence on how reliable forecasting really is. The program includes a PowerPoint presentation. Right Let's give a nice warm welcome to Mr. Tim Bolger, who forecasts the next 100 years. First of all, I would love. First of all, I would like to welcome everybody tonight. I appreciate. I know the weather is a little inclement tonight, but I would like to welcome everybody. To hang on. A forecast for the next hundred years, presented by me. I'd like to start off this pre thing with what I think is going to be the primary driver of the next century or the next hundred years. And that's going to be the science and ideas of innovation. What innovation exactly is, is a choice of making things together, of brains getting together, human capital, so to speak, and having that capital translated into ideas which make new companies, which make jobs. And we're all, in a sense, creative beings. And if we can all tap into that, creative aspect, I think we would be a lot better off. There's a guy by the name of Richard Florida who's an economist. He talks about the rise of the creative class. And he's, his whole premise is that the jobs of the future are going to be those that are creative. Right now in our country we have around 50% of our jobs being where you're doing some kind of creative endeavor. Whether you're an engineer, a poet, a musician, an artist, or yes, even a businessman. Yeah, we all know about things like creative finance. What exactly is innovation, however? Innovation is a process of taking new ideas to satisfy customers. It is a conversation, I mean, the conversion of new knowledge into new products and services. Thomas Edison, we all know, was supposedly the inventor of the light bulb. He wasn't. What Thomas Edison did was invent something much greater than the light bulb. It was the industrial laboratory where people would get together, test out ideas, make sure if they worked or not. His whole methodology of research was the impetus behind a lot of our innovations today. Most of your innovations on the internet took place at a place called Bell Labs, which too in and of itself was an innovation laboratory. Creativity, however, the stuff that you come up with to create in your own mind and innovation are really not the same. Forms of innovation are radical innovation and incremental innovation. Radical innovation is like when you go from a dial telephone to a GPS unit. Incremental innovation is when you go from like walkie-talkies to a flip phone from a landline phone, meaning that each piece fits onto another, a team develops more innovation, a team develops products further down the road, and we've seen this most primarily in the consumer electronics field, you know, where we, and computers, and we all can understand just what's happened in the last 20 years with the advent, advent of the internet and many of the radical innovations that that has brought about. Innovation in and of itself and the ideas that it presents is making a big difference in our lives. It is my contention that innovation is best served in a capitalistic system oh, yeah. where you have ideas that are tried and tested, companies that go bankrupt, new companies that are made, and over the last two to three hundred years it has developed and won and it has kept delivering on the goods. It is my contention that in the next hundred years we're still going to be seeing this, rat, this 
continuance of globalization, the continuance of capitalism, and the continuance of this innovative field of study proceed and finally get to the rest of the world. We're finally beginning to see globalization creep into parts of Africa, of South America, of many parts of the world that have not seen it. Innovation, too, is a key driver of change for ideas of capital and capitalism. That's basically how you get innovative ideas. The creative mind makes it. A team of people get together and either form some kind of company or a startup. They get the production methods down, and it's a lot cheaper to do so today. But that's the main idea what you need the capital of capitalism for. <coughs> also for economic growth. It's also self-explanatory that as you have incremental ideas getting better and better, goods get cheaper and cheaper and more people can benefit from them. Okay. For globalization, I think we've already explained that. And of course, it's going to be our big key driver for the next century. It's all based on ideas. That's going to be the next market force. Not land, labor, and capital anymore but the ideas that come from the human head into your mind. Now that's not going to mean that we're not going to need industry or factories or anything else. But as people get more together, collaborate more, connect more, ideas are going to mean much more. Since the end of World War II, roughly 30% of people have been involved in some kind of creative occupation. The engineer, musician, or any of those other types of where you have to use your creative mind to get moving forward. And it is my keystone thing here that the jobs of the future are going to be those that are mostly produced in the creative field. And the ones that are going to be the most rewarding are things like entertainers, musicians, people who can start up companies like Facebook and, and run things. Now, you may all wonder, why am I talking about this when this is supposed to be a forecast for the next hundred years? What exactly is forecasting? Well, forecasting, it is, it is a science of where you want to take a repeatable pattern and you're projecting it out. For example, let's just take a look at the Bollywood musical. It is a, it is a complete and total predictable pattern, you know. You have girl meets guy, Guys, girl, the girl's father does not like the guy. Three kisses, five songs, one fight later, you've got a Bollywood musical. It's the same thing with the empires. You have a revolutionary guard that comes in, they get to power, eventually they get corrupt, they're replaced by another power, and the process starts all over again. The thing is, with us, we're here about a short many 70 years, and the cycle of empires rise, fall, and decline usually take decades or centuries. A repeatable series of cycles or events that, uh, I guess I've just talked about the first part, but the trends move forward in a predictable manner, but at the same time, demographics can kind of screw up everything. If I'd have told you at the beginning of the last century that the British Empire would be out of power and be out of, and, 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 and never rise to its former prominence. Remember, at the end of the beginning of the at last century, before World War I, the sun never rose, never, never set on the British Empire. Nor did the uh, colonization. But remember, Right at the beginning, around 1910, there was an article written by a gentleman, I forget his name right now, but he predicted there would be end of no power wars anymore because the world was too interconnected. Well, we were interconnected, and our wars became devastating. Thomas Friedman had often said in his book, the world is flat, but now what's happened the world is now very fast. Ten years ago when he first wrote his book, The World is Flat, there was no, there was just the beginnings and inklings of YouTube. Facebook didn't exist. 
Twitter and a tweet was still a bird. <laughs> pin interest was still a board that you could place a pin on. And of course, Snapchat was still just a photo. And of course, I could name many other examples. This has all happened in the last less than 10 years. The model of the exponential curve will be the model that is followed in the next century. And there's three drivers that are going to be bringing this ex exponential curve into place. The first one is going to be climate. We've never seen a climate change so much like we have in the last century. We've increased our carbon just in the last 300 years. We've gone and increased our carbon to almost 450 things. We're seeing massive weather changes. We're seeing radical extinction of species. And we're starting to see it go up this exponential curve a little more. So we really got to watch what we're doing. The other curve is the market. We all know that the stocks and the bonds and, and everything else and capitalism's gotten faster and faster. It too is mounting a curve that's exponential. And of course, technology too. We've all seen what's been happening with technology in the last 30 years. Probably the greatest transformation in human history of what technology can be and what it's all about. However, population was also following that exponential curve, but it is my contention that this population problem is going to be solved. And when you hear the logic of I behind this, it's going to be make a lot of sense. You can see, too, that world population up until the year 2000 followed that classic exponential curve model. We were flat for many years, and then as we got healthier and longer lived and had more, be more things, the population naturally went up. But you can also see, too, that average world cap per capita income went up, too, as a function of time, so that more people, even though there was more population, more people had more money to spend, which meant a rising of the global economic tirade. Now, for those of you who may think that socialism works, you remember 300 years ago, the entire world was poor, and there was gross inequality between the lord of the manor and the peasant farmer. Yes, there still is inequality today, but if you look at Chicago housing projects versus the CEO of a major corporation, those at the bottom still have heat, light, a place to live, and other things. Now, I'm not saying that it's all just, but there has been some rising boats in the last 300 years through capitalism. It's not fair sometimes, but it still is the best driver for jobs and economic growth. Yeah. That means, though, that there are opportunities for corruption, there are possibilities of economic, of, of economic exploitation. I'm not saying that these are right because they're not. This is why we need unions, why we need watchdog groups, and why we need to watch the people who are actually running this system. Because if, they, if we don't do that, they will naturally, like what most human nature will do, tend to get what they want when they want at the cost of exploiting others. Now, with a good system, for example, if you're a large company and you start scamming your customers, you're going to be called to account for it, especially now with the social media. Look at what's happened to a company like Volkswagen when they were che cheating on their emissions tests. I can go into numerous other examples of how this has worked and how it hasn't worked. But needless to say, per capita pop income grew much faster than the population. Population numbers in the 2000s were about six times higher than in 1800. And average per capita income was about 19 times higher. The source from that is Jeffrey Sachs called the end of poverty. Now you can see world population growth has gone on for quite a while and is somewhat plateaued. You may wonder, why is this the case? Well, the main, it's all a matter of demographics and cost. From the Wall Street Journal from June 2014, the cost to raise a child was around $300,000, not including college. Annual child rearing expense estimates 
range between 12,290 and 14,320 for a child in a two-couple, two-child married couple family in a middle income group, which is defined as before tax income between $59,410 and $102,870. The biggest share of, of the expense in raising a child, according to the report, is housing at 30%, followed by child care and education at 18%, food at 16%, transportation at 14%, and health care at 8%. Children are becoming a big investment. When you don't have money and you don't have developed, children are a source of labor. They, they work and they, they, they help you provide it in old age when there's not a lot of investment behind them. But children, as they get more expensive to raise, and we're not only talking to 300000 to get them out of high school, now we're talking about college. Now we're talking in their 20s, the financing of helping them to find themselves. And then, of course, them coming back at the end of their first job and perhaps the parental help in getting their family debt, their college debt paid down. Most children today, couples, you love them, but they're becoming a luxury good. Every family can have a couple of them, but come on, five or six with the expenses? Most only have one and two. This is why there are less children in developed countries, and of course, these children do grow up, and they will be our citizens in the next 100 years. It's worth the investment to take care of them. As you can see again, the population in the developed countries work tends to go down. According to CIA estimates, at about $10,000, that's when the price of having children becomes more of an expense rather than an asset. Now again, I'm putting this in terms of pure monetary relationships, but anybody who has children knows they're going to do whatever they can to get them well and adjusted. And with the things of like, you know, family planning, birth control, and some other measures, people can now plan their families a little bit more radically than they could have even a hundred years ago. This population trend also means that the population over the next hundred years on mean is going to raise the average age of the population. There will be twice as many old people in the United States as there was now. And that means the more old people, the more voters. People in their 20s like to fight like to get things done. But people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s like to be calm. They like to be peace. That's what's going to be the major driver in bringing in a little bit more of a peaceable century. The world is going to be a better place. We are living longer. We are getting healthier. We are getting more prosperous as a species. Here are the trends in a historical context. i got to hang on here. i got to make sure the volume is up on this thing here. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So, down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? 
all countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over. Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you just seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah, pretty neat, huh? How is the world going to evolve? The nation state is still the main means of organizing people and culture. There's going to be no major power wars between nations, and I say that because there's something different today. It's called nukes. And I think because we have to restrain ourselves, I don't think we're going to be seeing another major power war. U.S. is still going to be the dominant power. Globalization's relentless march will still continue. There will be a rich and a poor, but the growth as a group will continue. By the way, that uh, statistical presentation you just saw was done by a gentleman by the name of Hans Rosling. You can access it by Googling his name. I'll give you more stats at the end of the presentation. But he does a lot more incredible things, the visualization of data. The thing is, though, there still is a gap between the rich and the poor, between rich nations and poor nations. I'm now going to play another video from a gentleman by the name of Thomas B. M. Barnett, who talks about the countries that are connected and the countries that are not connected. I'll let him explain. I'm going to make the argument about the new map. <laughs> I'm going to give you a sense of where I place the book, depending on some 
in comparison to the debate that's been going on since the end of the Cold War, trying to figure out, in effect, what we're fighting about. Go back to 1989. First really important book on the scene, I would argue, Francis Fukuyama, End of History and the Last Man. And he asked the essential question we've been wrestling with ever since, which is, after ideology, what's the fight about? Now my old professor Sam Huntington put on a marker his concept of the clash of civilizations. Basic quick historical tour. He talked about people clashing way back when. Over time they organized themselves into states. Over time those states organized themselves into blocks. And voila, we have the wonderful march of history. And this is what we face. So he gives us a point. And on that basis, the debate starts. The debate is joined by one of the most influential books I've ever read, Tom Friedman's Lexus and the Olive Tree. And at that point, we got a spectrum, I would argue. My shorthand for Friedman is basically globalization. Some people get it, some people don't. Eventually, everybody's going to have to. You should recognize this message. I like to describe it as fundamentally marks on steroids. <laughs> if you read The World is Flat, Friedman's finally come clean on that, thanks to the help he got from Michael Sandel at Harvard, another old professor of mine. Sam's counter to that basically was globalization. Some people are never going to get it. Never. That's going to be the basis of a lot of fight. <coughs> What I try to do in the Pentagon's new map was add a third point to that. In effect, create a plane. My argument for globalization was, and I'm really trying to combine the economic argument here, the social argument here. Hang on, I've had a complaint for volume here. I'm just yeah. going to see if I can get it a little louder. I'm going to make the argument about the new map. I'm going to give you a sense of where I placed the book, Pentagon's new map, in comparison I'm to the debate that's the rest going of this video and since the end of the Cold War, trying to figure out, in effect, what we're fighting about. Go back to 1989. First really important book on the scene, I would argue, Francis Fukuyama, End of History and the Last Man. And he asked the essential question we've been wrestling with ever since, which is, after ideology, what's the fight about? Basically, what he's simply saying is this, that there is a rich country and a poor country, that there's an area that if you look at the United States in a military context, we have been fighting not major power wars, but we've been fighting wars that are less and less contained. There have been 150 roughly calls to action or small mini battles. And they've basically been waged in the same countries like Africa, the Middle East, Central America. And we have been fighting not nation states, but groups of individuals. And although we should be prepared for major war, that our military needs to take a look at the elements of globalization and get the fighting force to reflect it. That means more things like special forces. That means more things like light troops that are able to get in and get out fast. And then he also argues later on in the book, like Bush did not do in Iraq, if you're going to invade a country, take down their networks and take down the dictatorship or whatever it is, you better be willing to spend the money it's going to take to develop that country. In other words, to nation build. Your 18 year olds, you like them to fight. They're young, they're pissed off, they have a lot of testosterone. And that's what they want to do, is go out, fight, and maybe police, and play guns. The ones you want for nation building are those people who are like the veterans of the civil service, between 40 and 50 years old, between, uh, you know, who had a little experience, much like that cop on the beat who's had 20 years experience, or maybe that veteran social worker who's been around for a long time. Those are the, the diplomats. Those are the guys you need to come in to nation build. We in the United States don't do this very well. We're very good at fighting other countries. 
we're not very good at taking down other networks. I mean, or, or building a nation. What we should have done in Iraq was if we had gone in like we did and gone in with some of the general's recommendations, not take down their military, not take down their other items, I think we'd have been a lot better off. The Balkans, for example, were a good example of where we went in, we took down and took out the, the dictatorships, but then there was a lot of aid and a lot of help in getting those nations back on track in the early 90s. But anyway, now let's get back to our presentation. That's exactly right, Charlie. You bomb out, you take out the dictators and the main elements of power, like, for example, with precision weapons, if you have to, to take down a dictator, dictatorial government. You don't want to destroy waterworks, infrastructure, anything else. Military bases, yes. Maybe pinpoint bombing, yes. Just enough to get the government out of power and surrender, and then you can go in and rebuild the nation. That's what Barnett's belief is. It's not mine, but it is what Barnett's saying about having to change the military structure around. If you remember after World War II, we still had things like the Marshall Plan that came in to fight communism. We spent a lot more money rebuilding Europe than we did tearing it down. Okay. Stay out of my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get back to where it was at. Play from here, Tim. Play from here. Go under slideshow and play from here. As you can see, the biggest next trend is globalization's integration to what we call the non-integrated gap. That's what Barnett was trying to explain in the video between the non-integrated countries and the integrated whole, and where most of your conflict is going to be occurring over the next hundred years or so, will be in this area as they globalize. According to a recent study that was done in the 1960s by the CIA, the most trouble you have in a country when they're trying to globalize is just at the beginning of their <coughs> integrating with the world. When the, when the knowledge starts going up, when a few start getting educated, and then they want to take power and they don't want to give it up. That's what's happening in Africa right now. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, the rest of the world can see us. We're integrating much, much more. And the rest of the world can see how we live. And they want us. They want to be like us. Supposedly, Oliver Twist has come to town. And he doesn't like what he sees. The U.S. will be the dominant power over the next century. You have to understand that we're uniquely positioned geographically to have this happen. We have uh, two coasts where we can re re relatively put in a naval presence on both the Atlantic and the Pacific. We're continent-wide, and we don't have any hostile neighbors to us above in Canada or in Mexico below. Although I believe in the last two decades of the next century, there might be a small border skirmish between the United States and Mexico due to cultural differences as Mexico modernizes. This is the dawn of the American age. For the Europeans, the age of America has passed several times this century. The Europeans delight in thinking about the decline of the United States. But when you look at the objective factors of American power, such as the American gross domestic product is larger than the next three or four countries combined, uh, such as the fact that the U.S. Navy controls all of the oceans of the world, you find that the Europeans are focusing on passing bubbles. That the underlying reality is that American power is enormous. In 1980, for the first time in human history, trans-Pacific trade equaled transatlantic trade. This changed the world irrevocably. Until that point, the North Atlantic was the gateway to Europe and therefore the gateway to power. Now, Europe has not disappeared by any means. It's equaled by Asia. But both of those bodies of water are the trade routes. The United States is the only major power that's native to both bodies of water. And therefore, it has not only a trading advantage, but a military advantage. 
it can project its power into both the Atlantic and the Pacific. And therefore, ultimately, it controls the patterns of trade that exist. Destructive and creative capitalism go hand in hand, as has been said many times. And one of the strengths of the American system is that it destroys old industries and lets new ones be born. And one of the weaknesses of the rest of the world, particularly of Europe, is they don't let the old go. They hang on to it. As far as our next rising powers, I think the next dominant one is going to be Japan. I'll let our last guy on video by the name of George Freeman explain. Japan is the world's second largest economy. It towers over China economically. It towers over Germany. It towers over the United Kingdom. It has the largest navy native to the Pacific. It has a substantial air force and has an army that's larger than the British. The idea that this country is crippled vastly overstates it, but it goes through cycles. And as China weakens, as Russia weakens, Japan is going to be forced, even against its will, to take a more assertive role. But certainly after the United States, the largest and ultimately, one of the most dynamic economies in the world will continue to be the Japanese. I think you can see what I mean. <laughs> Turkey is going to be the Middle East's salvation and will be the second rising power for key of growth and peace. Again, I'm going to refer back to George Freeman. We must remember two things about Turkey above all else. It has one of the largest and fastest growing economies in the world, and in the region it by far has the finest armed forces. For 500 years, Turkey was the organizing principle of the Islamic world. Since 1918, it withdrew in itself. But it is returning. Turkey is returning to the prior state that is no longer a factor. There will always be radical Islamists in the Islamic world. There's been for a thousand years. But the challenge of the Islamic world now is to recover from the chaos imposed upon it by the United States in wrecking Al-Qaeda. Whether the country is Iran, whether the country is Iraq or Afghanistan, whether it's Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, the desire now is for stability within an Islamic framework. And simply put, Turkey is so far the most powerful Islamic country, and so much the most economically effective, and historically the leader of the region, that is very difficult to find any way that will not reemerge into that. As we said, I think Turkey, once the oil prices get a little lower, and those regimes in the Middle East have to start actually collecting taxes from their people instead of dividends from royalty, that's when we're going to see a peaceful Middle East. And of course, because of that, yes, the rise or re-rise of the Ottoman Empire over the next hundred years. Here's the one that really struck me as kind of funny. I was doing the research again with George Freeman, and it's going to be Poland. That's going to be one of the largest powers in Europe. I'll let him explain. We have to remember that in the 17th century, Poland was the great European power. And bear in mind, there was a reason for that. But let's discuss exactly what's happening. Russia is asserting itself. As it asserts itself, the boundary between Russia and Europe is the Polish-Russian boundary. Poland is, for the next 10 or 15 years, 
what West Germany was in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. It is the front line. Something very interesting happens when the United States allies with a vibrant, uh, well-trained, disciplined country. And you take a look at South Korea. If in 1950 you had said that South Korea would be one of the great industrial powers of the world, the laughter would have been overwhelming. If in 1950 you had said Israel would be one of the great technological powers of the world, the laughter would be equally preposterous. What do these two countries have in common? They were strategic partners of the United States, in the United States achieving certain strategic ends. Remember, the United States has decided to put the ballistic missile defense system in Poland. It has decided to give F-16s to Poland. There's a huge amount of technology transfer going on because when you give an F-16 to a country, you have to train thousands of technicians to maintain them. And you train them in everything from computing to jet engines to things having nothing to do with these, such as food service. It follows from that that after 30, 40 years of this, Poland will look much more like South Korea or Israel that it will look like Romania. The Olympics, of course. However, you might be wondering why I brought up these three rising powers. I did promise you a little bit about Russia and what it's doing. Russia is not changing any ideologies. The only thing that has really been stable over the last 200 years has been its military and security apparatus that have kept the country going. I'm going to again devolve into uh, George Friedman's ex example on this. He runs a company called Stratfor. Hello, I'm David Judson, Editor-in-Chief of Stratfor. Today joining me is George Friedman, Founder and Chairman of Stratfor. Um, I want to talk about what's kind of obvious, which is Russia in the broadest sense. Uh, but what I want to specifically talk about today, George, this week you, in your column, raised the yet open question, can Putin survive? That question remains open, but I kind of wanted to back up to the history of analysis we've done looking at Russia and its changing power relationships with it, not only itself, but internally, but uh, with the West, and goes take us back to 1998, uh, when we raised the, basically the question, can Boris Yeltsin survive? Well, I mean, 1998 came after a major financial crisis in Russia, and the realization that uh, Russia, as it was constituted in 1991, 92, didn't work, and that uh, privatization had led to the growth of massive oligarchies mm -hmm. and that Russia was really being humiliated in foreign policy and how could Yeltsin survive and it became increasingly clear that with all the problems that Russia was having the kind of regime that Yeltsin had couldn't survive and that he wouldn't and that's what led to um, a forecast uh, so then we, I moved back going through the you know, countless dozens if not hundreds of forecasts that we've done, small and large, and picked 2001 when we did a forecast, considered somewhat outrageous at the time, that Putin was consolidating absolute power. What was the methodology there? Well, the only institution that has ever truly functioned in the Russian Empire, going back to Just the 19th century, about. was the security apparatus. In a country as vast as Russia with this poor communications, the central government could only hold a place together by empowering security people, Okhrana, Czechists, NKVD, KGB. And this is what functioned, and it was still the only institution that was functioning in Russia in 2001. And it was less about Putin than about this institution reasserting itself and trying to bring some stability, repressive stability, but stability. And Putin, being a KGB man, was the one that that system threw up to do this. 
And there was a kind of logic. If he was going to bring control to the situation, he was going to have to become far more autocratic, far more repressive, and far more assertive throughout the entire system, because it wasn't working. And so from that, we said two things. One, he was going to last. This was not just another pretty face, as one of our articles put it. Uh, and second, that it was going to be a very different sort of regime. And the one we got. And the one we got. And then, you know, again, looking retrospectively here, we get to 2004, and our forecast that said the area, at the era of concessions is over, pushback against NATO, we had the Orange Revolution, uh, the uh, effort to undo that was beginning. You know, amplify that a bit. The Orange Revolution was a rising in Ukraine against essentially pro-Russian government. When Putin saw this, he believed, rightly or wrongly, that this was an operation carried out by the CIA and Western intelligence services to impose a pro-Western government in Ukraine. Whatever, however it happened, a pro-Western government arose. And Putin looked at that and said, this is the attempt by the West, first to betray all the promises it made not to come into the former Soviet Union, but also uh, it is an attempt to destroy the Russian Federation. And the West has shown itself to be an enemy. It is hostile to Russian interests, and therefore we will treat it that way. And this began the process where Russia began to emerge with a stronger military, a much more aggressive policy, much less cooperative. So, as Mark Twain is alleged to have said, you know, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, looking back through all of this, uh, I hear a bit of history's rhyme. Uh, right. Can you bring that forward to this focus of this, I say, open question, can Putin survive? Well, Putin was very successful for quite a while. He managed to create a viable economy. And he also managed to create a sense of his power when he invaded Georgia in 2008. It was not just about Georgia, it was about Kiev. It was basically telling the Ukrainians, this is what American guarantees are worth. The United States was caught in the Middle East, had no ability to protect, defend. He created a sense of power, and that cr went on until Syria, for example, when he appeared to school Barack Obama. What happened was that the Ukraine, which was always the battlefield, the always a crucial area for Russia, it was the buffer, experienced another rising. The president was deposed, a pro-Western president was put in place, and he was left in a position where all the things he'd achieved starting in 2004 were dribbling away. He held on to the Crimea, the West called this an invasion, the Russian troops were there already, a thin strip of land along the Russian border, the you know, Russian-Ukrainian border. What he was hoping for was a general uprising against the Kiev government. It never materialized. He wound up in a situation where he held Kiev, uh, Crimea. He held a few towns that are now under attack by the Ukrainians. And he had suffered a massive defeat. Ukraine is everything to the Russians. This is one of the ways, a buffer, that they can defend themselves. They at least want an anti-Western government there, whatever they do internally. They lost all that. So the, that was lost, but also the economy is in very bad shape. Uh, it, the Central Bank is predicting no growth this year in spite of $100-plus barrel oil. And we're ago. also looking at a situation where there's massive outflows of capital out of the country and declining, dramatically declining, foreign direct investment. The economy is in trouble. Putin's claim that he schooled the Americans, Putin's claim that he demonstrated that Russia was a power again, uh, really is being held up for question. And the apparent incompetence of shooting down a, an airliner simply compounds the sense that he's lost his touch. He's been in power for 14 years. He did extremely well for a while, now he's doing very badly. And among his closest supporters are his successors. Right. So I guess we'll leave it sort of there. As you can see, you know, a lot of times Russia basically is trying to get back with the security apparatus and they're trying to get back their authoritarian rule. Again, though, because the forces of globalization are coming in, 
Russia's economy right now is based mostly on minerals and mining, oil, and the export of natural gas. The problem with Russia is that it has been and has had an authoritarian history for quite a while. And in 1992, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they were a humiliated power. My contention is that they're going to continue this until we start linking up with them. And I think there are two recent developments in Russia right now that are very much obviously overlooked. Now this is me talking, not Friedman or whatever. The first is that they completed a transcontinental railroad back in the, in the early 30s and 40s, but that railroad was never a good one. It wasn't until the 1970s that that transcontinental railroad, the one that crosses six time zones from Irkutsk all the, way to Mos all the way to Moscow, was running. It's now double tracked. It's now running firmly. They can get troops across six time zones in a matter of a couple of days or a few hours. Plus, it also means the movements of goods. The problem is Russia doesn't have a lot of people in it. Their population per square mile is vastly down. They have a lot of land. They have a lot of potential capital, but they don't have a lot of labor. Yeah. The same goes true with the vast step in in, uh, in Asia itself, countries like Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And we in the United States, a hundred years ago, had a similar situation. The difference was in the governance. The United States, probably in its greatest legislative battle ever, was called the Platt of Survey Act of 1792, which basically divided the country into, into uh, manageable units of size of townships and counties and other, other items to where they were able to get the land in. And then the United States had a democratic form of government, a rule of law. Yes, we do, did do some things wrong, like with the Indian displacements and other things. But generally, the reason why the West was able to get settled was because we allowed people to come in. We allowed people to settle. We allowed people to get into communities where they can live their own lives and basically integrate into the American system. Charlie, we can debate that later. <laughs> the thing is, though, we've seen all the benefits of globalization, of development, and the problem of climate change, the problem of carbonizing our atmosphere. Just what are we going to do to power this future for the continuation of globalization? For nations to keep prospering, to stop global warming, to keep people healthy and long-lived, and to provide a future for our children. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Ben. Mr. McGuire. Come with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, Joanna. water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. This isn't nearly hot enough to generate electricity effectively. So water-cooled reactors have to run at over 70 atmospheres of pressure. You have to build a water-cooled reactor as a pressure vessel. The number one accident people worry about, <laughs> pressure is lost. Water that's being held 300 Celsius <laughs> flashes to steam. Its volume increases roughly by a factor of a thousand. If you don't get emergency coolant to the fuel in the reactor, it can overheat and melt. 
This is what drives the design of this building. So if this happens, all the steam is captured in this building. Now the reactors we have today use uranium oxide as a fuel. It's a ceramic material, chemically stable, but not very good at transferring heat. If you lose pressure, you lose your water, and soon your fuel will melt down and release the radioactive fission products within it. So they have a series of emergency systems designed to always keep the core covered with water. We saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators, and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on. The tsunami came and knocked them all out. And people tell me, is nuclear energy safe? And the first thing I say is, well, which one? Thousands of different ways to do nuclear energy. I was like, is the car safe? Well, which one? I had the good fortune to learn about a different form of nuclear power, the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. We can fully burn up the thorium in this reactor versus only burning up part of the uranium in a typical light water reactor. It's not based on water cooling, and it doesn't use solid fuel. It's based on fluoride salts as a nuclear fuel. You have to heat them up to about 400 degrees Celsius to get them to melt, but that's actually perfect for trying to generate power in a nuclear reactor. Here's the real magic. They don't have to operate at high pressure. They don't have to use water for coolant, and there's nothing in the reactor that's going to make a big change in density. Unlike the solid fuels that can melt down if you stop cooling them, these liquid fluoride fuels are already melted. In normal operation, you have a little piece of frozen salt that you've kept frozen by blowing cool gas over the outside of the pipe. If there's an emergency and you lose all the power to your nuclear power plant, the little blower stops blowing, the frozen plug of salt melts, and the liquid fluoride fuel inside the reactor drains out of the vessel, through the line, and into another tank called a drain tank. In water-cooled reactors, you generally have to provide power to the plant to keep the water circulating and to prevent a meltdown. But if you lose power to the lifter, it shuts itself down all by itself without human intervention. A staggeringly impressive level of safety, even if there's physical damage to the reactor. Thorium is a naturally occurring nuclear fuel that is four times more common in the Earth's crust than uranium. It's so energy dense that you can hold a lifetime supply of thorium energy in the palm of your hand. We can use thorium about 200 times more efficiently than we're using uranium now. And because the lifter is capable of almost completely releasing the energy in thorium, this reduces the waste generated over uranium by factors of hundreds and by factors of millions over fossil fuels. We're still going to need liquid fuels for vehicles and machinery, but we can generate these liquid fuels from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and from water, much like nature does. We can generate hydrogen by splitting water and combining it with carbon harvested from CO2 in the atmosphere, making fuels like methanol, ammonia, and dimethyl ether, which can be a direct replacement for diesel fuels. Imagine carbon neutral gasoline and diesel, sustainable and self-produced. You can see that uranium-235 is like on par with silver and platinum. Can you imagine burning platinum for energy? Yeah. And that's what we're doing with our nuclear energy sources today. We're burning this extremely rare stuff and we're not burning thorium. You know, some people are kind of environmentalists and they say, listen, nuclear power is not sustainable. We're gonna run out of uranium. Okay, I will yield that point to you if we're talking about today's nuclear technology. In 2007, we used 5 billion tons of coal, 31 billion barrels of oil, and 5 trillion cubic meters of natural gas, along with 65,000 tons of uranium to produce the world's energy. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri. Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year? He goes, I think about 5,000 tons. 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mind. It's a nice mind, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave, Instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people. Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization? Because we're not going to run out of this stuff. We will never run out. It is simply too common. All right, all right. <laughs> there you go. Basically, I'm not here to, to tell you what your thoughts are on nuclear power, but I honestly think that we're still going to need centralized power that's relatively safe. Now, I'm not going to say that all nuclear power is safe because there is radiation, there is the cost of transport, there is, even if you put this liquid fluoride thorium reactor out, 
even though you could provide the entire power output for the city of Chicago in a room about this size, you're still going to have to deal with that basketball-sized piece of thorium at the end of its life cycle and maybe some of the uh, radioactive isotopes in there. The thing is, most of them go away after 400 years. Oh, and a lot of the stuff can be made into medical radioactive isotopes that can be useful for fighting cancer and other things. To summarize, though, however, innovation and ideas are going to drive the future. The world is aging because children are more expensive to raise. Globalization will continue on its pathway forward. The United States will continue to be the dominant power for the next century. We will see the rise of Japan, Poland, and Turkey. Personally, I see that the world's going to be powered by uh, lifters. And I think our next century is going to be a peaceful one. But it's still going to take something, an effort, from all of you guys, from all of you. Because you all have a creative part in you, and you want to raise your children right. You want to do a, you want to be able to make the world a better place. I beg of you. As a matter of fact, I would like to see all of you develop your creative talents. I, for example, go into a group called Toastmasters where I learn the art of public speaking, where I'm able to do a presentation like this and present the good in the world. The point is, if you don't speak and you don't do this, somebody else will. And you may not like what you hear. We have before us the potential for a prosperous future. But we also have before us the potential to have a very, very different world. It's up to you. Unleash your creative potential. Unleash your talents. Get the schooling you can to get a decent job. Better yourselves. Or let the government do it. Let the authoritarians take over and see what happens when the world goes under dictatorship. I implore you. All of you, speak, develop your talents. Now I will take your questions. Yes. Second curtain uh, first. Uh, Actually, I have Gene Harker. Uh, Tim, you talked about thorium. So uh, I guess there's no thorium uh, uh, producing uh, energy now. When do you predict, what year do you predict we will have uh, thorium energy at a industrial level, say running the city of Chicago's electric system? Right now, India is integrating thorium fuel control rods into their present-day nuclear power reactors. There are some 300 people in China right now working on this very problem to do it. And you also have to realize that we had a working reactor that was of a liquid kind, although it did use uranium. We had a reactor that ran for 6,000 hours that was already done at Oak Ridge. And the first thing the Chinese did when they came in was open up all of our government documents and archives. And as a matter of fact, our Department of Energy is working on that right now. Based on the best, my guess, less than five years, commercial viability in less than six or seven, and because this is so desperately needed in China right now with the pollution problem, I honestly think that this is going to be around a lot sooner than we think. Now, I'm not going to say that there's not problems with nuclear power, but it's still compared to the carbon spewing of coal and the carbon producing problems of oil, we need a viable alternative. And for me, when you can get your entire lifetime supply of energy in a ball about this size versus the comparable part of oil, I honestly think that that's one thing we're going to be pursuing with an aggressive power. Renewables have a place, but by the time you figure the land, the capital, the expenditure of putting up these massive turbines, these massive arrays of solar panels, even though Germany's done it, 
what you understand about Germany is they're buying a lot of their electricity from France, which is almost 90% nuclear now. That's true. And about maybe about, I'd say about six, seven, eight years. It's coming along, but. All right. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, is Islam going through a reformation right now? What will Islam look like in 100 years? The uh, religion plays a big and dominant part in the Middle East. The trouble with religion, and I'm not saying the trouble, religion basically was started because there was a bunch of scarcity. People needed a code of conduct to live by. When you start getting prosperous, all of a sudden, you get things like the gay people coming in, you get progressivity, you got plenty. And people start to do various things with plenty. Islam right now is at that stage where the people in the Middle East are starting to, some of them at least, are going to be prosperous. You also have to understand that I honestly believe they're going through their 1960s right now because about 60% of the Islamic population right now is under 20, under, I'm sorry, under 25. It's only just a matter of a few years before the old guard goes out and the newer, more progressive people come in and a reformation is going to take place because a lot of Muslims don't like their religion to be represented by thugs, which is exactly what ISIS and a lot of these guys are. Thugs and people who just don't want, are using Islam as political power. Islam will reform probably within the next 50 years. You have to remember, under the Ottoman Empire, when it was controlled by Turkey, Islam and the Islamic countries had were, were had a little bit more of a progressive attitude. They invented, you know, it was in Turkey where the modern number system was invented, where they actually invented a zero and other concepts. So Islam has had a history of progressivity. Of progressivity. The reason I think it's been so so. Uh, uh, stunted and, 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 it's, and, and, fundam and fundamentalistic is because of the rise of the Middle Eastern oil powers and their financing of the Wahhabi mosques. That's coming to an end. Oil will either run out or with the, with the oil price being so low, those Middle Eastern countries are going to have to tax their people now. And that means they're going to have to be, those governments are going to have to be in by the will and consent of the people versus them getting money to hold down the people in the traps. Have I answered your question? Thank you. Uh, Bill Webb. Uh, what yeah. What's the, the dollar going to do over the next hundred years? <laughs> it's probably going to remain the world currency for a while. And the reason I say that is because the United States still is going to be the dominant global economic power and what the Federal Reserve does with that dollar is going to have worldwide implications. We've exported inflation around the world in the last eight or nine years because of the massive growth of our increase in the money supply. And because that currency is not backed by anything, we have racked up tremendous debt. However, I do believe that if the rest of the world continues forward, we can pay off that debt, but it's going to require us to maintain a strong dollar, maintain a strong fiscal discipline, and not get into a hyperinflation like we did in Germany. Because if we do, the world is basically going to be crazy. I would say over 10 years, the dollar is going to remain the dominant currency. Probably with the rise of other superpowers like Japan, it might be the yen. It might be what, I forget what the currency is in Turkey. It might be one of those, but lira. the what? Lira. The euro. The lira. The lira. Yeah. And as far as the euro in Europe, I'm not sure if the European economic community is going to much exist in the next 30 years or so. Because basically, Brussels has not taken the proper steps to federalize Europe into an integrated whole. The power still lies with the nation states. And if you remember, in our country, 
We, as the federal government, assumed all the debts right after the Revolutionary War, and the federal government started to assert itself in various and sundry ways, and we made the country a whole. This has not happened in Europe. Basically, Europe, since the end of the World War II, has been an occupied continent. The decision to go to war has either been in Moscow or in the United States. The major nation states have not had the real authority. And with the immigrate, with the immigrant crisis happening, it's starting to fracture again. And you've got to remember, even though Europe was the dominant powers for many years, since about 1492 to about 1992, it's been in an almost perpetual state of civil war. Yes, yes. Uh, Winona. Yes. Uh, what and then Charles. What are the, what, what are, what are the main economic drivers for Chicago in the next century? I think Chicago, locally, it's going to be, we're still a transportation hub. And I honestly think it's going to be the same things that drive the world, you know, transportation, innovation. When you're locally, Chicago is in a unique place. Richard Florida talks about the world not being flat but somewhat spiky. He talks about places that are available to, like, artists and those musicians, engineers, with a cheap housing stock and a lot of older buildings, that means Chicago has the affordability, the diversity and quality of life that will attract people to it. Chicago is in a rather unique place because it isn't as super expensive like it is in New York <coughs> or San Francisco or even somewhat Los Angeles, California. It's still compact. You still have a lot of areas of the city that may be considered blighted, but the housing stock is relatively cheap. And you have an atmosphere recently of startups, of people collaborating together to form companies. And that's what's going to ultimately drive the city of Chicago's economic growth. You also have your access to capital. We have four major stock markets. We also have a lot of people and financiers. See, Chicago in and of itself is not geographically linked up like London and Paris and New York. We're stuck in the middle of a continent. We have to get our trade from two different from two different coasts. And we also have to we have a big lake. That means we still have to ship everything in. And that means we have to think about how to do it better. And that's why it's still the rail hub of the world. Many of your major highways come in here. And believe it or not, the Port of Chicago still is one of the more busier ports in the Great Lakes. That brings a lot of grain and a lot of iron ore and a lot of coal into the region. Ultimately, Chicago is also a very diverse economy. Unlike Detroit, which is concentrated mostly on auto building, we have everything here from steel mills to information infrastructure that is vast. We have probably one of the largest concentration of data centers in the country, next to Tyson's Corner. And it's relatively diverse enough, geographically isolated enough, that I think we're going to see some really good things happen in the next 15 to 20 years. Did I answer your question? All right, Charles? Yeah, Tim, in your nation of the future, it seems that uh, childbearing will be restricted, will the American dream will be restricted only to those who have sufficient income and are successful. My and question. how many, what percentage of the people uh, will be eligible in your new world of capitalism to share and partake in the American dream? And my question to you is, Charlie, were you listening to the presentation at all? Because nothing was said about that. People you know, all kinds of things about how much kids cost. Yes, I know that, Charlie, and that's the driver of why people are not going to have them. It's by voluntary choice. If you want to have five or six kids, go ahead and have five or six kids. Make sure, though, that you can raise them. So our people, society will not provide for all children? I never said that, Charlie. It, only, it will not provide for children at all? 
Under Charlie, any circumstances? Charlie, you're putting words into my mouth. I said <laughs> people have kids. They generally stop having kids when they get more expensive to raise and the population is declining because people are voluntarily making a choice not to have five or six kids because of the cost, and it goes down to one or two where you stabilize population. And that, my friend, is a good thing. I am not saying that if somebody has five or six kids and needs help from the government or some kind of social safety net that we can't provide for them because life is important. And I believe that part and parcel of what government needs to do is provide some kind of social safety net. Now, if somebody, and I'm not going to get in here, but I never said what you claimed that you had said. I had never put in to what you said. I said the population is going down because of the expense of raising kids. They're very precious. They need to be cared for. They need to be taken care of. They need to be educated. And if anything else, our government needs to invest more in the infrastructure of human capital. And that means schools. That means kindergartens. That means child health care. That means programs for bringing kids up. Free college? You know, and that kind of thing. Recreation. Re correct. Now, what, now, we got more questions coming in. Yes? What year was that uh, that guy was speaking um, there were, there were, um, okay. George Friedman runs a, uh, a company called Stratfor, S-T-R-A-T-F-O-R. And what he does basically is does basically a lot of forecasting. I started studying him about three, four years ago and had found that a lot of his videos are very informative. The reason I use a lot of his stuff is because he is much abler and quicker to encapsulate the concept quicker than I would be able to do it live here at the college. We had a limited time with the stuff. And those videos, too, are also heavily edited by me. I dropped them off YouTube. I edited them up. There were some fade-ins and fade-outs that I used. But I needed to use him because there was a... The time element, the way he explained it, was much better than I could. Now, those videos were taken over a period from about 2010 to about 2014. Okay, and they looked older. Yeah, yeah. and okay. I'll, I'll be honest with you, in the development of the speech, this, the basic infrastructure of the speech is about three years old. And I had to tweak it and take it around a little bit more just to integrate the, the, the flow of refugees, the flow of people. We now are seeing record low oil prices. We're seeing various trends in that just needed to go in. For example, you know, Thomas Friedman, in 2004 when he wrote his book, The World is Flat, he mentioned things, the ten flatteners of the world. The world going on steroids through three things that were happening through information technology. Then he came back later and said it's now fast instead of flat. Remember, ten years ago we didn't have Facebook. To, you know, and I went through that earlier. Have I answered your question? Yeah, I just wanted to know how old they were. Okay, so next. They yes. Like yeah, a couple uh, years. Me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A, couple uh, years, a couple years ago, a uh, retired one star was sitting next to me at a party, uh, and we got into what turned out to be a two-hour conversation on what the next war is going to be fought over. Not oil. He was convinced water. that water is going to be the issue. Looking at a map, the largest source of fresh water in the world seems to be the Great Lakes. Does this mean that we and our uh, Canadian cousins are going to be in the kind of position that Saudi Arabia and some of the other countries uh, in the Middle East are? If they dispense the oil. Will we be in that kind of a position dispensing the fresh water? And if so, are we making any preparations for that role? Have we even thought of that role falling on us? The thing is, with fresh water, I, with the widespread deployment of some kind of centralized, high-powered reactors, like these lifters that I'm talking about, that problem is virtually solved because with heat, 
that's a byproduct from this reactor, virtually you can also desalinate water, which solves the problem. If we don't do that kind of energy infrastructure, and one of the scenarios that your friend said, it will be fought over water. Because remember, there is a limited amount of fresh water. <coughs> China right now is having a water crisis. That's why they're damming up every river that they can, piping it into Beijing, making these large public works projects to keep people in water. And a lot of it is because it's polluted. It's sort of like what the problem was in London in the 1850s before they had a centralized sewer and a public works project. And even here in Chicago, we've just spent, I think, a total of $4 billion on the deep tunnel project in order to manage our water, to run the storm water through a sewage treatment plant and to temporarily hold it. The problem is not with water availability, but clean water availability. And that's going to require just like London and Paris and America went through, we're going to have to spend vast amounts of money on basic infrastructure in third world countries. There still is a lot of labor, a lot of land, a lot of capital that's available from them. But if we in the United States are not going to be running water like they import oil, because it's still a lot cheaper to desalinate than to transport and vast ships or cargoes or whatever. And, you know, even the Arctic Ocean itself still has these vast continental ice shelves. And a country like the Middle East may or may not have water, but eventually there will be distillation plants built. The chance of the next war being over water, more than likely it will be if we don't figure out a way to make water plentiful through some kind of desalination. Have I answered your question? Beautifully. Okay. Go on. Right. Next. No more questions. Coming for a water. Okay. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. We still got a couple left. Uh, how, how does uh, wind energy? Wind energy is a great thing. But, you know, you got to remember that even wind is, is very intermittent. You know, when the wind blows, it, it thinks. But you're going to have to make a storage medium for wind power, you know, like a battery or something. And the way the grid works, you know, you have the, the peak power in the morning, you have the, the, the low power in the afternoon. Wind energy is very variable. And the one thing that grid operators want is clean power. So if you have a lot of power variance, it's going to have to go into some kind of storage medium. And there's been a lot of incredible things that have been done with wind and solar energy. The price is going down. The amount of storage capacity is going up. The amount of innovation that's being done with, you know, getting things out of wind turbines is great. But in order to really fully utilize it, you want to get a 300-foot wind turbine up and a vast field of them in, like, say, a 10 square mile space. That's a lot of work a lot of infrastructure. I'm not saying it can be done, because it has been in other countries, but they found you're still going to need that backup power. And that backup power is natural gas. And actually, if you're running a backup natural gas to wind energy, there's actually more emissions from the gas energy thing than there would be if you were running it at a more of a constant state, just varying it up and down. Remember, a car runs more efficiently on the highway, and it doesn't stop and go traffic. And that's where I think wind energy is not going to be the best thing. Like I said, it's got its place. It's getting cheaper. It's getting more innovative. But as far as replacing oil or replacing fossil fuels, it's not going to happen. You see, even nuclear power in its short-lived life, and with the disadvantages it has, it's still producing close to 40% of our electric power in the United States. It's only been 50 years old, and it's already taken a part of about 40% of our power. Even though there is the waste problems and everything else, it still has been a good power source as far as there. When you have chemical energy, 
you, you have a lot of, of power. But still, with nuclear, that much thorium or uranium could power your entire energy supply for an entire lifetime. That's the difference. Now again, I'm not going to knock renewables because they do have a place. They do provide clean power, but they also need to be backed up. And unless you have some kind of good, solid, high capacity battery storage, which they're coming down, but not at the scale that is needed to really take away the variability that you would see between wind and solar. You know, when the sun don't shine and the wind don't blow, but you have a lot of battery backup, you can make it a viable power source. But at this point, that's still not happening. Yes? All right, Charles. Yeah, do you fully comprehend the difference between a correlation and causality? Yes. I mean, I can throw a lot of charts up, but that doesn't mean there's any nexus or connection between one chart and the next. Because just jumble the assortment of charts. And I could substitute, you had the development of population, I could substitute the development of the railroads for that chart and get the same conclusion. I could plug in any number of one charts that are the same thing. You're talk, multiple you're, conclusions. You're talking about the exponential curve, right? Yes, all of those. And didn't I say that the exponential curve's been one of the biggest driving forces in, in, in today's society? The railroads growing at an exponential rate. Doesn't that all have to do with the increase in population, the increase of industrialization, and the increase in largely uh, the transport of goods? Follow up. The development of the railroads affected civilization around the world. That's correct. It had absolutely nothing to do with population. I think it did. Uh, one, one guy, one engineer. Are you going? Well, Charlie, you know, I tried to tell a comprehensive story with the charts and the graphs. This has been in preparation for a long time, and I think I just basically outlined how population is getting healthier, how per capita income is going up, how that's being driven by globalization and capitalism. I've also made the correlation that capitalism is not perfect, that it does have its flaws, and that's left unregulated. You'll get all kinds of mischief and malfeasance. That's why we need unions, and that's why I agree with you on a lot of stuff, that labor does need to be represented. But at the same time, we also need the destruction of old industries with the progress of new industries. I hope I've answered your question. All right. Yeah. Steve Cungus, you have a question? No, sir. No, I'm, I'm getting excited about hearing rebuttals. Okay. Oh. And I think at this point, <laughs> let's get to our rebuttals. All right. All right. Yeah, All right. boy, Tim. How many here have rebuttals to give? Uh, it okay. doesn't have to be... So a rebuttal, it has to be something you are passionate about. Okay, one, two, three, four. I'm going to put a timer on. I go first? Oh, Gene wants to go first. All right, let's make it a timer. All right, Gene. All right, we have at least ten rebuttals. Yeah. Uh, besides, including rebuttal. I'll get the projector back on. Tim. Only the aristocracy. About how much time do we have for our uh, rebuttals? We should have 20, I think. Does that mean we have about two minutes each? No, I don't oh. think so. Oh. What time is it now? What do we do with all these non-creative people? We, uh, Send them to Rubio. Who's the war meeting? It's 8 o'clock. Is that only great? All right, we got. That's all. Probably about four minutes apiece. All right, our first rebutter is Gene Parker. Turn that thing off. All right, that's the one. And our boy. Boy, that's the one. Yeah, thanks very much, Tim. Oh, well. A very interesting presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I will be here in uh, 2023. I think I will pass away before that. But I hope some of you guys are here to remind him 
uh, what he said and uh, to uh, celebrate the thorium uh, industrial production of energy by then, probably right here in Chicago. Uh, Turkey, now that is really interesting. That is kind of interesting. I'm trying to figure out why Turkey is spending so much time and energy trying to get into the Euro, into the U U U European Union, not the Euro, exactly. But why, if it's this massive power, why is it trying to get into the European Union? That is a poser. But I guess we'll see. Maybe we'll figure that out before 2023. Thank you. All right, brother. Hey, we got about four minutes here. I haven't read it. Go ahead, 2023. Okay, sweetie, I got it. I got it. Um, <coughs> my wife suggested that I make this announcement, that I'm, uh, I will have a art show, 13 drawings that I made are at uh, the Intuit Gallery, which is at 756, 756 North Milwaukee, Chicago Avenue and Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago until January 31st. So... What hours, hours? The hours? Uh, look on their website, it's www.art.org. They are open seven days, six days a week. They're closed on Mondays. They're open Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and uh, nice there are some political, nice some political uh, drawings about Russia and Ukraine, actually. And there's some about peace. There's some about war, and there's some about um, some Jewish stuff. Jewish stuff, yeah. Anything else you have clown, to say? Clown stuff. No clown and clown stuff, stuff too. Go. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> as far as the world in 2116, uh, I don't plan to be here, but um, I'm sure it'll be a fine world with a lot of art and music and. Uh, beer, and wine, and things like that. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. No Putin. While Tim was making this speech, I told him the next 100 years is easy. Within the next 30 war years, we're going to have World War III, and it'll all be over. All we're seeing up. One thing I wanted to say about thorium, I think we missed a great opportunity with Iran. <laughs> We were worried about Iran wanting nuclear power plants so they could enrich uranium to make bombs. We should have given them the lifter reactor. It would have been a great place to test it. And we would have found out truly if they, want, if they wanted uranium for making bombs or for if they were just looking for nuclear power. Because with the, with the lifter, you cannot get bombs. You can't make bombs from thorium. So if they really, if their intention was to get bombs, they wouldn't have wanted the thorium, and we would have known right then and there if we had offered them some yes, lifter yeah. reactor, and we could have had a testing ground for it. All right, all right, all right. All right. Keep it tight. Oh. Okay. Inevitably, every time that we have one of these college or complexes dialogues, uh, a lot of times the consistent conclusion that a lot of us come to is we need more planets. So when I think about we need more planets for the obvious reasons, I think, well, maybe we don't need more planets. We just need to share, learn to share more, and that sharing is a strength that we haven't really honed very well throughout our history as far as our governments. But as far as we the people, we have honed that skill very well, and maybe our leaders have not really uh, utilized that wonderful part of who we are as humanity. So I'm going to read this on the note of creativity. Every eye can see that very gold. Every writer knows that fork in the road. Every time there's a choice of an open door that either imitates, emulates, and follows, or is original 
and innovates encourages one our own. Earth in love with our discipline. The rebirth of our hearts was not an easy one, but we eked it out to reach the now, to live knowing we have so much to give. So in that spirit, uh, hopefully the next century will be a lot about one of our greatest strengths when we're not seven billion people all one eye alone, the entire humanity together, and that's sharing. All right, all right. Good job, good job, brother. Good job. Keep it all for yourself. All right, brother. Hey, all right. We can read. It's mine, it's mine. Prediction is very difficult, especially in the future. Well, one prediction that I think that all of us are. Uh, one of the most for war is peace. I think predicted the Vietnam War. Not exactly where, but the war that's not fought to win anything. Just to dissipate the products of human labor and human energy. And to keep people poor. And I think that is the best. Uh, it wasn't a very specific prediction, but next time you get a chance to look at war is peace. I do it. I think he predicted the Vietnam War 40 years before it happened. There was a great society dictionary that came out during the Vietnam War. And he called George Hallow, a British capitalist, author of 1968. But uh, one thing I, I do have to disagree with the prediction of stability for the dollar. Uh, I think we're going to see something within two, uh, 20 years, I think we're going to see a runaway inflation. It does. It'll be like the rise of Germany in 1923. And that's a big away for Hitler. You don't have any other market to kick around anymore. I'll get you up and yeah, I also think that uh, I'm a good fan here. The original intent of the Russian clauses in the Constitution would be more or less coming ordinary knowledge. I've, I've had this 10 years ago. I'm a president of the email around and trying to get some support for it. But it was all both the gun control and the controversy is over the draft. It's composed for military service under the Constitution presented with militia clauses, not the army clause. All right, Brother Bill. All right. Here you go, man. Oh. Salve. Hail, fellow Romans. Whether we like it or not, we are the new Roman Empire. That is both good and bad. The religion many of us follow is based, at least in part, on the old Roman religion. Our legal system is based, in large part, on Roman law. Uh, our business customs, in general, are based indirectly on Roman systems. And our military is based, to a very large extent, on the makeup of the Roman army, which is not, from a military point of view, a particularly bad thing. However, we have much, unfortunately, in common with the Romans in about the third century. Right now, we have American troops stationed in a hundred countries throughout the world. We, we have ourselves spaced so thin, we run the risk of making the same mistake that the Romans made in about the third century where they were spread so thin, they were overrun by a number of countries to the north. The Goths, the Germans, the Franks. It goes on. Uh, we are not in a position any longer to defend our own borders. We're being overrun in many ways, Europe is being overrun. They can't control the flow of refugees, and that's a non-hostile flow of refugees. We are in perhaps the greatest crisis in Western civilization that we've seen in close to a thousand years. And yet, what are we doing? 
Absolutely nothing. We refuse to learn lessons that should have been learned in first, second, or third grade when we first learned about the Roman Empire and the reasons for its decline. Any nation that spreads itself both thin and hopes to dominate effectively much of the world is doomed to failure. You cannot, you cannot take an army uh, unless you draft every man, woman, child, and four-legged beast into military service. You cannot expect uh, to defend that large of an area. Ask the later Roman emperors. It was a nightmare that kept them awake at night. And eventually, what happened? Rome was overrun by the so-called barbarians, which incidentally, most of us in this room are descended from the barbarians. Uh, you know, I'm a Celt and a Norman. Uh, so, I mean, we, we, we certainly were not welcome uh, at the table of many Roman aristocrats. Uh, our ancestors had to kick their way through. Let's hope that we find an easier, better, less traumatic way of absorbing some of the problems that we face today. We don't have to solve every problem with a war. I am not a pacifist. I never have been a pacifist. I believe there is a time and a place for uh, strong military responses. However, we are magnificent in teaching our troops how to very effectively fight the last war. We sent troops to Vietnam, indeed to Korea, fully schooled in all of the strategies necessary for winning World War II. We sent people to the Middle East fully schooled in all the techniques necessary for winning in the jungles of Vietnam. We keep making the same mistake. We're one war behind the time, and as a matter of fact, I am behind schedule right now. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman just uh, motioned, I guess he was telling me to stop. Thank you. What's your name? All right, thanks a lot, buddy. I want to agree with Pat and, and, and with the gentleman over there said about the I. There should be no I in, the, in, in a world of seven billion people. A hundred percent. Also, I want to get back to what Pat was saying about the uh, a number of bases. Pat, the official Pentagon number, I'm just the official Pentagon number is 668 bases in 48 countries. Rand Paul, he leaked out, there's actually 900 bases in 130 countries. So I want you 100 percent. How about, I, I say, how about we cut that in half? What's wrong with cut that in half, right? Bring the boys and girls home. Bring the money back home. Control the world. And we have a stronger, uh, stronger military. Right now. So I, I concur, and the numbers are, you know, they fluctuate greatly out there. What everybody's saying. So, so Tim, Tim came from an inspirational. Good, good, great job, Tim. Really, a great job, man. Good presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, to uh, predict, you know, get, to to ship present that. I got to tell you, um, Tim came from an uh, uh, inspirational angle. I'm going to come from a, uh, eh, a little bit of fun angle, okay? Uh, I, what I thought about for the forecast for the next 100 years are, the first thing was, uh, I hope everybody's aware that uh, Google is now experimenting with a selfless driving car. Is everybody aware of that? Yeah. No driver in the car. How about that? The only thing I can think of is, you ready for this? Every bar or, or, or smart people or drunks, when they get out of the bar at 2 a.m., all you got to do is program your car and you say, I want to go from the bar to my house, and you pass out behind the wheel and it drives you home. What's the matter with that? I love this idea. It's as good as a horse. Thank God for modern technology, man. No more DUI tickets. Wow. All right, then. Landing on the moon in the next 20 years. I believe that's going to happen. They're, they're talking about landing on Mars, but uh, listen, the last time we landed on the moon was 1972. Is everybody aware of that? The last landing, last feet on the, on the moon was 1972. 
and they want to talk about going to this is NASA, and they want to talk about private, you know, private guys like Bezos and who's the other guy, Elon Musk. They're trying to go to Mars. How about they try to go to the moon first? You know, experiment. You try to go close and, and confidently. You can definitely go to Mars. Moon, land there, and you can definitely come back. So I'm not sure we're going to be going to Mars. Uh, in the next 20 years, we'll be landing on the moon. Civilians will be landing on the moon. Uh, solar energy. i got to tell you what. If everybody thinks about the um, uh, flat screen TVs, if you think about the VCRs, the DVD players, remember they were really expensive? And most of us, like, I don't, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I waited for the price to come down. And it came down pretty doggone fast. So I think, and, and, and Tim's right, it's going really fast with the uh, solar energy. I think in the next 25 years, we're all going to have some kind of solar energy uh, uh, being used by all of us. Wow. Uh, next 25 years, population explosion. Everybody knows we don't have enough young folks to pay for the old folks on Social Security and Medicare. So we will be seeing a population explosion. Also, STEM. STEM will be, Charlie mentioned about this, how are we going to take care of the kids in the school? Uh, uh, STEM, we're going to have STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. That will be the core of course throughout grade school and high school. And then, of course, the high school expanded uh, uh, curriculum. Also, there will be a new movie experience where you will choose a character and experience in the movie wherever you want to look eyes of the character. I think that's a real thing that's going to happen pretty soon. And the last one is we'll be able to eat 5,000 calories of food and be able to burn it off in our sleep with some kind of uh, device. Thanks. Uh, I'd right, like to compliment Tim on a well-researched presentation. Uh, it's obviously you've been working on it for many, many months. Uh, it's a culmination of years of thinking. Um, your presentation is based on what appears to be the best research available. And on a couple of points, uh, as I mentioned in the past, uh, Project Censors publishes a book every year with the top 25 blacked out stories. The media runs, a, it's a two-pronged process in America. They promote the myth on all channels 24-7, and they simultaneously run a coordinated blackout on the reality. So people living in America can live under a bubble of illusion that this may be happening in the future when there is absolutely no possibility of that happening. Amory Levins, when he was traveling around the world in 1988, giving uh, energy efficiency consultations to other countries, companies everywhere, he, he always used to tell people what already exists should be considered possible. Everywhere he goes, oh, well, that's that's impossible. We'll never get that efficient. You never have a motor that efficient, or you never have light bulbs that efficient. And he would give them the name of a company that's been producing that motor or bulb for the last three years or whatever. Things are being produced all over the world. There is a uh, Buckminster Fuller in, uh, published a book in '84 called Critical Path. He said every five years we get as much change as the previous 50. It's going up on an exponential curve. Tim is absolutely right about the rate of change. There is a rooftop revolution of rooftop revolution of solar panels and wind power simultaneously happening all over the world. It's happening now, and the cost of energy generated by those two puts any kind of nuclear power or nuclear power dreams in the crapper, totally. There and there is no capitalist funding for any generation of nuclear power anywhere in capitalist society, anywhere in the world, because solar now, solar and wind power both are vastly cheaper, coupled with efficiency. Houses are being built now that have no utility lines coming in. With the new high efficiency refrigerators, windows and doors, walls that don't use heat, don't lose heat, you can run the house off of a few square yards of solar cells on the roof with minimal battery backup to get through the night. That is happening and has been happening for quite a few years, but unknown to people because of the press. There's three main facts that weren't covered in tonight's presentation, and if those are covered, it gives you a different view of the future and the possibilities. And Martin Luther King was quoted uh, way back in the 60s saying, any nation that spends more 
on machinery to kill people in the military than it spends on social uplift programs is approaching spiritual death. And that's where we are in the United States. Um, millions of people are working to change the idea that we can continue to support a trillion dollars a year worth of eight or nine hundred military bases and an empire in over a hundred countries around the world. That trillion dollar a year budget is absolutely decimating the American economy, the American middle class. Albert Einstein said, the human race is in a race between education and extinction. I'm not sure who's winning. He nailed it 60 years ago. Neil Klein and a whole bunch of other writers on environmental uh, issues and global warming has summarized hundreds of thousands of person years worth of data that shows we're very close to the tipping point on not being ha able to have a viable future if we don't do something about the tonnage of fossil fuel and pollutants that are going into the atmosphere. A lot of people think that we passed the tipping point and it's over. The other scientists think there's still hope, but we have to get a World War II type of mobilization going in the next year, or two, three years, pour funding into everything related to stop burning fossil fuel. The car companies have been testing 100 mile per gallon prototypes since 1980, at least. Our current world policy, last point I'm gonna make, our current world policy that the United States is uh, why are we fighting terrorists around the world? That's all based on one giant myth that was created and sold to us by the media on the morning of 9-11. <coughs> all seven old office buildings that have been slated for demolition were destroyed in one day and the media sold it to us as a terrorist attack by 19 crazed Muslims. Now other people have said if we wanted to take over uh, the oil drilling off of the coast of Norway, we would have been attacked by 19 crazed Norwegians on 9-11. Every piece of what we've been told of that myth is a total myth and it is driving policy and everything else. So we puncture that myth, we can free up a trillion dollars. Smedley, the last, last thought I'll leave with you is get a copy of Smedley Butler's book. General Butler wrote a book called War is a Racket. He said, draw a 200 mile radius around the United States. Let our military defend that 200 mile perimeter and quit meddling in the affairs of countries all over the world and you see how fast world peace will begin to develop if you help people with living equipment rather than wartime. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Incidentally, uh, when some people are a little bit less, uh, you know, never mind. That's why we let you go no longer. Einstein also said, the the left, hope you know, know, just two things that are, <laughs> I hope we Einstein also said, I know of two things that are infinite, the universe and uh, the Before my rebuttal, so sure a quick point of information. Uh, the European Union is not run by nation states. The European Union is run by large banks. Uh, the world had this fact right on its face just a few months ago when the German and French banks screwed Greece a nation state member of the European Union. There is no known system for generating reliable predictions. There is, however, at least one known system for generating predictions guaranteed not to be right. And that is straight line extrapolation. Just take everything we've got and, and pretend it's going to keep going the same way because it won't. Um, so, so repeatable cycles might repeat, but that's not all of what's going to happen. Uh, averages. Averages are very badly abused. The average American has 0.98 testicles. <laughs> Take the number of Americans and divide it out. Okay, if Bill Gates goes to a soup kitchen, the average net worth of every person there is a billion dollars. It's Bill Gates and 50 pounds, but that's the average. Right now, one one thousandth of our population owns as much wealth as half of our population. You can, arithmetically, you can do an average on that, but it, it's not meaningful. 
Um, a century ago, which is the interval we're talking about, Europe was ruled by kings and queens. A quarter of the surface of the of the land surface of the earth was owned by England, as was a quarter of the human population. England was extracting astronomical quantities of wealth. When the English went into India, India had 30% of the world's wealth. When the English left India, India had 3% of the world's wealth. A parallel example, during the 20 years that King Leopold of Belgium personally owned the Congo, enormous quantities of wealth came out. All that went in was guns, which, and, and at the end of those 20 years, the population was half of what it had been, but Belgium was flooded with wealth. That's not a result of capitalism. That's a result of being the best killers in the history of the world. The British killed better than anybody ever. That's how they got so rich. If you're looking, if you're looking for, for exponential growth, exponential growth by nature ends in a crash. There was a, time, a period of time a few years ago when every year over twice as many people were online on the internet as had been a year before. The population of the internet was more than doubling every year. Well, obviously, we're not adding new people to the planet fast enough to keep that up, and all of a sudden, bang, there stopped being so many newbies. That's a, a, a simple and clear exponential growth, but that's how it works. And exponential growth in capitalism gives us the panics and crashes that, 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 that were, were such disfiguring scars on the 19th century history and in our 20th century history. We have a new gilded age, which could lead back to some of those baloney averages. Um, right now, the internet threatens, directly threatens, every power relationship in the world. And politically, is, or, or, or uh, national politics is only one area, but every nation in the world is scared of the internet and trying to control and trying to squelch. And nobody quite knows how they're going to do it. You, have, you need free information to have a modern economy. When Egypt tried to close down the internet because they had a revolution going on and people were twittering, it took 36 hours because the bankers said, no, you can't close down the entire economy. We need the internet. Um, and, and finally, since I'm, I'm getting my, my wrap up, a century ago in the United States, there were more people in domestic service than there were working in factories. More maids and servants and butlers than there were mill hands. We are now headed to a updated version of that because we cannot employ everybody in manufacturing anymore. There, we would be making just too much stuff. We are heading toward a service economy, full unemployment, where most people are doing things for people rather than making things. All right, all right. Okay. Uh, how long has there been police brutality in Chicago? Long time, right? Right. Uh, John Burge, um, Fred Hampton. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just want to say that protesting works. You got to keep the pressure up because uh, we got loud in front of Ron Emanuel's house, and we got very loud in front of Bailey Plaza, and we got so loud that the Department of Justice is coming to Chicago. So, uh, so just I'm just here to tell you that protest works, democracy works. Just need to get out there.
that our speaker came to, uh, Tim, uh, you wanted uh, more nation building, smaller wars, uh, with less destruction. In other words, the neutron bomb uh, is you know, the new uh, weapon that, that, that we're going to use. Uh, we're got, not going to destroy the buildings, we're going to destroy the people in them. Uh, so, okay. Uh, less destruction. And, I, no, a, a, a rehash of, or a, a remolding of the neocons. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid that Capitalism, whether it was the old imperialism or uh, the uh, little wars that we've had since World War II, uh, it doesn't mean peace in our time. Even if the First World War was a capitalist war uh, to end war, it didn't. And uh, I, I'm afraid that uh, the rivalries over whether it's water or uh, <laughs> uh, or thorium or uh, the grid work uh, to supply the, uh, the nuclear energy uh, or whatever other energies we're going to generate. Uh, it's good. It will warm the globe, and we will. There's no solution to that global warming while every nation is looking out for its enterprises and itself and uh, letting the devil take the hindmost. Uh, so, I, uh, I'm not too optimistic uh, about uh, the, the uh, pro-capitalist uh, destiny of the uh, world. Uh, what does it uh, come to? Uh, a neo-fascism.
uh -oh. race. <laughs> Where is it going to be? Where are we going to be in Chicago? Not to mention any place else in a hundred years. You know, uh, do we do away with the categories? Uh, I wrote for the census in 2010, and uh, you know they attempted to address that by having the category where you didn't have to, you know, you know give your ethnicity. Um, but I think Chicago is a testing ground for how the rest of the country is going to deal with the, uh, the race issue. And uh, I think that it could even be a separate, you know, um, talk where we just deal with that, you know, and uh, give us some thought and do some research and come up with where we think it's going to be in 100 years. Because uh, uh, if we don't get that taken care of, you know, um, and, and maybe the things that Tim brought up, the changes, that will take care of it, you know, but uh, it has to be given some thought and planned for uh, so that, um, you know, we don't either end up in a worse place, regress, or don't change at all. So thank you again, Tim. Okay. I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to the next time. Come on back. Come on back. All right. All right. All right. Okay, Are you right. a neo-fascist? <laughs> all right, now, well, we're losing in a neo-fascist stage. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to get yes. moving because we've got to get out of here. Okay, yeah. just yeah. two quick things with Tim. I, uh, where, is, where we stand today, you know, we are in the Eisenhower era of uh, military-industrial complex, bombs over everything. There's about a dozen companies that make lots of money off of wars, like Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, all the rest, they love having wars. Big money, good, good Wall Street money in that. So we got to change that around because that's the state we're in right now. We are in the military industrial age, and I don't believe any of these jihad wars. I don't believe any of these stories about reasons to go to war or we got to chase ISIS. I think it's a bunch of garbage, poison, and I think it's just to keep our military industrial complex uh, in the money. And I think it's all made up by the Pentagon and the CIA as uh, a way to make their profits in Wall Street uh, expand. Having wars and more wars and more oil wars and resource and land wars. And the last thing, Tim, I got to tell you about Wall Street. We were in, a, in the verge of a depression and we did 50 or 80 billion dollar a month stimulus that we bought the bonds of all these ailing banks and stock brokerages in new york and we did that for about five years it was around three or four trillion plus other stimuluses so if you think for one minute that our wall street and our industry and our innovation got us out of this um, depression from 2008 you got, a, you got another thing coming. It was the government and Congress printing a lot of money and buying a lot of nasty bonds on Wall Street. <coughs> so printing money got us out of this, and we will have to see what the uh, reper repercussions are. But a lot of money was printed for stockbrokers and bankers, and it's trickled down a bit. All right, let's go. Thanks. All right. All right. All right. population stuff and standards of living, Neil kind of hit on this. Um, you must make, everyone is afforded the opportunity, whether they choose to or not, to establish, even in a tribal society. And what it was this, the standard of living would be the highest, according 
do you, in, in a small tribal society because the wealth is shared among few individuals. That's ridiculous. Um, these statistics here. Um, no, you must afford, uh, everyone in society must be afforded the opportunity to share an opportunity to establish a nuclear family and the children that result from that family must have a positive future. This has been determined to preclude revolution and civil disturbances. Um, and you must ensure that this, I, I, this has to be the basic tenant requirement. Um, this thing about affordability, I'm sorry, it's, every, it's society. Can society afford children? Not individual parents? And the other, okay, let's jump to another one. I've studied American history for years. Do you really think today that they plotted all the land in the United States? What was a significant event that is acknowledged? This is among what people? The day they, they marked up all the land that they took from the Indians. Um, and what's this guy with this bubble map? I have no idea what that is. As a matter of fact, I found it a little offensive because he said he had no problem with the fact that he took China and he said, well, there's, there's poor people in China and there's rich people in China. He thought that was okay, I guess. That's no big deal. I, to me, it said, like, why doesn't, and what all, yes, he did. He pulled one out and he said, this is a poor province and it's a rich one. He why isn't there one okay China? Why isn't there, there one China, one bubble? Not separate little bubbles. He pulled the ass. That's ridiculous. Too many bubbles. Too many bubbles. You're in one country and there's rich and poor people. Oh, that's okay. Well, oh, it's due to the population of some other city. Never said okay. You know. No, I didn't. And, then, and the other thing is here, this technology thing, is well, it has nothing to do with population. So some guy invents a better mousetrap. You know, and it shares the technology with society. Uh, I don't know what that has to, as I was saying, the invention of the railroad to steam engine, absolutely nothing to do with population, in fact, enabled the expansion of population. That's right. Now, the thing about thorium, you're way off base, and Andy gets on it, we gave a little thing here, there's a thing called availability, called, here we got, oh, we're going to be working on it 10 years, or 20 years, and all, and all this, there's a thing, and they use it all the time, it's called passive solar, it's not complicated. You can go over to Target and buy one. You can get a solar thing and illuminate your American flag with it. They use them on railroads all over the place, all those switches and things like that. Off-the-shelf technology right now, no moving parts. Do you know how technical a thorium reactor it is? Not very. Oh, my God. To keep Not on going. going, and then it's never going to malfunction. They complicated things never break down, and they know, and technology has never posed a hazard to mankind. No. Thank you very much. All right. No, thank you. <laughs> that guy pulled a china. What is that? It's one I don't know what so I made up something I don't like, and I don't like it. Charlie, I must admit, <laughs> you're engaged in the talent of creativity in technical spin that I haven't seen for a good long time. <laughs> it's called the creative juices flowing, Charlie. You should have been a propagandist. Propaganda? Yes. I'm not an anyway, <laughs> you know, Charlie, it, 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 technology has changed, but it hasn't really changed that much. Instead of I heard it through the grapevine, I've read it on Facebook. <laughs> There was a poem submitted to me. What's your name, by the way? Jonathan. Jonathan submitted a poem, and I think it's one of the more uh, perfect things to close with. Every eye can see that buried gold. Every writer knows that fork in the road. Every time there's a choice of an open door that either imitates, emulates, and follows, or is original, innovates, and forges one our own. Earth is in love with our discipline. Rebirth of, the heart, of this heart was not an easy win, but wrecked it out to reach this now, to live knowing we've so much to give. All right.
thank you very much. Thank you. Know, we we should adjourn tonight. And uh, thank you very much for attending, and I appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Thank you.